Good morning. Warmest welcome on this not very warm morning. Person online, glad you could join us. Announcements of note beyond the routine. This very much beyond the routine. Caleb Clyde Madison, born Friday to Tim and Hannah, all doing well, and congratulations. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, Saturday the 27th, Congregational Annual Meeting, 10 o'clock with a potluck following. Reminder to anyone with the report as soon as possible would be great. Not to forget hearty thanks to yesterday's great construction crew, 12. Um, we're off to a great start. Psalm 113 begins Praise the Lord. Say it in Hebrew. Hallelujah. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Who's that? We're asking to praise him. Servants? Well, you think um, <laughs> ministry team, trustees and council, musicians, guys who were doing construction here yesterday. That list goes on, and indeed it does go on and on, all the way down to the kids who come up with the children's story. Remember the Palm Sunday account? Children in the temple shouting, Hosanna, praise to the king. We serve him with our praise, all of us, giving him the honor due. So again, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's pray. Lord, we're going to praise you today. To honor you in our song, in our prayer, in our attention to your word, in our fellowship. Lord, help us to lay aside everything, giving you are undivided. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's sing, beginning with the traditional doxology, Greek word meaning simply praise. So let's stand and praise the Lord.
month of January has become for the American church a time to advocate for the sanctity of human life, encouraging, among other things, ministries like our local pregnancy options. For its scriptural basis, for what we see as the personhood of the human being from conception onward, turn to our psalm for today, 139. Oh, let's read. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when I was yet, when there was yet none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake. And I am still with you. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Recalling our opening song, it begins with an exhortation to praise. You servants of the Lord, praise him. And then moving beyond exhortation, it's a prophecy, a promise. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. You could be forgiven for wondering at times if our side isn't losing. Admit it, things can look pretty bleak, pretty hopeless. But our psalm assures us the last chapter doesn't read like that. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the world over there will be praise. No doubt there, if there's uncertainty, it's us. Will we be in that praising throng? We pray for that when we pray, thy kingdom come. Well, let's pray now, beginning as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, we thank you for the glad certainty of your victory and that you have made us more than conquerors. However strong the foe, however difficult the battle, however bleak the outlook may see at seem at times, help us to hang in there, believing your sufficiency and supporting one another. We really thank you for the great gift of prayer. Lord, we know your victory is secure. 
from the rising to the setting of the sun, it isn't automatic. We pray for your servants who are taking your gospel message to the ends of the earth, and especially now we pray for the new recruits from our family of churches. Razor family in Japan, Matthias and Ellie, destined for Chad, David and Janice from Taiwan, also bound for Chad. Lord, protect them and equip them in every way to take your word where it's so badly needed. <clears throat> Again, we bring before you the Ministry of Pregnancy Options, so badly needed in a state where fetal life isn't being much respected. Pray that they'll get the support that they need and the encouragement. Lord, work has begun on our getting, building up to code. We thank you that you have opened the way so far in so many ways, and permission from the authorities, finances, volunteer help. Lord, continue to provide. Pray especially for Jeff and his leadership, and we pray for protection for all those willing hands. The election cycle in our country has begun with so much potential for disorder and trouble. Lord, we pray that order will prevail and that your people will truly act the part of salt and light as you intend to the blessing of our communities. And as we pray for your kingdom to come in our world and our communities, we pray also for our daily bread, our daily needs, our own needs. Health concerns, we have a plenty. The Lord's super cold weather only adds to the difficulties. We pray for healing, for encouragement, for wisdom, when to go out and when to stay home. And Lord, help us to keep supporting one another in prayer and mutual hope. Help. Now, Lord, open our ears and our hearts to your message, to the kids, and to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I want the kids to come join me. You pray to me? <laughs> well, everybody's over there. <laughs> I can't come to you because of this. Anyway, afraid. <coughs> you know, um, when I was your age, but some of you were younger, I was afraid of something. I was afraid of the dark. Anybody afraid of the dark? Okay, now I understand. You'll understand it. I was afraid of the dark. And I could give you a lot of situations, but at night, in our house, my brother and I slept in a bedroom, and the bedroom was, uh, we had to walk down the hallway to get to the bathroom. And, well, in the middle of the night, my, my, my parents, they, they, they never put a night light in. It was dark. I mean, really dark. And I was afraid of the dark. And I didn't, I didn't have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night every uh, at night, but I did often. And I would get up and uh, <laughs> I'd walk down and I'd go, I'd go down to the next door and, Dad, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> My poor dad. <laughs> Did you ever do that, Steve? Oh, no, 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 no,
But I, I really was afraid of the dark. Now, you know, I never, um, I got over that pretty much, but the one thing I never thought of, and I'll bet you've never thought of this either. I never wondered, is my dad afraid of anything? <laughs> you ever thought about that? Well, I'll tell you a secret. He is. He may probably wouldn't even tell you, but he is. I wouldn't have told my kids. But anyway, the question was, you see, I would call out to my dad when I was afraid. Who could my dad call out to when he was afraid? Well, I knew my dad pretty well. And I knew who he called out to when he, when he was afraid, even though when I was a little kid, I wouldn't have ever thought about fear, but for him, but I know that my dad talked to his father in heaven. He talked to him a lot. And because of his example, he taught me in growing up. And you know, I still went to my dad when I was afraid, but then as an adult, I couldn't do that anymore. My dad had taught me to talk to my father in heaven. And I do that all the time when I'm afraid. And you can too. And he'll listen. You know, I can see my dad. I can't see my father in heaven. But he's there and he's listening. And that's the one you can always talk to. Well, we're going to sing a song we actually sang a couple of weeks ago. We're only going to sing the last verse. Away in a manger. But uh, anyway, let's stand. Everybody stand up. We're going to sing that one little song. Last verse. <laughs> Often when Jesus wanted to, um, to talk to people and to get them really thinking, he would introduce it by asking them a question. And you see that when you read in the Gospels, you see him doing it over and over. You know, one case to his own disciples is, who are people saying that I am? But he would do this, and he did it because he asked questions that people had to think about. And often he'd get very negative responses, and at other times just kind of, oh, I don't know. And, but, but it made people think. When Philip Yancey, um, he introduced himself to the Christian world a generation ago, when he wrote a book, it was bestseller, and the title was simply a question. A question that virtually everybody asks sometime or other. Where is God when it hurts? Where is God when it hurts?
Well, in our whole season of Christmas, we were focusing on the fact that it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah, and then it was quoted in the in, in the book of Matthew, where it said that God would be with us. But what did that mean? You know, the world we live in is not a very sympathetic world. It's full of fear, it's full of worry and pain and grief, conflict and and, you know, and loneliness and, and faithlessness and, and uncertainty and, and, and the question just keeps coming back. Now, think about it when it comes back. When you're in church and, and thinking about this kind of stuff, we're all very comfortable and, and you know, and wow, we've got the answers, don't we? And at three o'clock in the morning, when you can't sleep, And there are things that are bothering you. And then that wonderful feelings that you might have had when you're in church, where are they? Where's the tension, the separation? I want to take you this morning to a, a what might seem like an unexpected kind of a source. But I want to talk today what does it mean when God says, I will be with you? What does that really mean? Mark, the first chapter, it's Mark's Christmas story. It doesn't really tell the Christmas story. <laughs> the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In all the country of Judea and in all Jerusalem, they were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Father, thank you that you have preserved these words for our encouragement. Encourage us today. Amen. I want to share with you just three ways in which it is true that God is with us. The first, we celebrate at Christmas that God is with us in, in his humanity. When Jesus, God's son, came into this world as a human being. Now I want you to think about the particularly those of us who have had children who are adolescents. There's that peculiar season of adolescence when our adolescent kids are beginning to go through all kinds of emotional chaos. You can't escape it. All kinds of questions, all kinds of stuff. The sort of things that they can't share with their parents because after all, 
I mean, I, I could never have thought about my dad having the sexual thoughts, imagination I had when I was an adolescent, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, could, my parents wouldn't understand that. They'd never. Well, the adolescents going through this. Parents, they were there once. They know what their kid's going through, but their kids aren't going to share it with them because they don't think we'd understand. Why did Jesus, God's son, why did God become a human being? Live here for 33 years. Experience all the things we do. Hunger, thirst, heat, cold. Although we never, he never suffered through you know, what we're suffering through in this, but fatigue, difficult relationships, difficult circumstances, ultimately death. As the prophet said, he was a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. Did he become a man so that he could understand us? He created us. He became a man so that we could understand God. Understand that God is compassionate, that he is sympathetic, that he understands us completely. You read the gospel stories and you see this. He is with us in our humanity. He is with us in all the stuff of living, the stuff that makes up your day, my day, all the little things. He's with us in all of it. The second, Jesus' baptism. Now, Jesus' baptism is one of the most curious events, certainly, in the New Testament. John, this prophet who walked right out of the Old Testament, he was the one prophet who was prophesied himself. He was just man of the desert. Some of the prophets were, some weren't. He was a man of the desert. He, Desert food, desert clothes, all of that, utterly set apart. He had been given a special call by God to prepare Israel morally and spiritually for the coming of their Messiah King. John never did a miracle. But you know, he was different. Most of the prophets, they had to go to the people tell them what God was telling them. With John, the people were coming to him, and they were flocking to him. They were flocking from large distances. They'd walk for days. Come to him to the Jordan River. And they were responding, and they, they were doing something that we would usually think of as something about, oh boy, you know, <laughs> this thing called repentance. But they were coming, and they were at, they listened to his preaching about what God was saying. And, and they came in this great anticipation because John was proclaiming the king was coming. And so when they came in repentance, they were confessing their sins. I mean, right down to the nitty-gritty details, not, not this kind of thing we do in churches. Oh, I'm a sinner. No, you know, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a, you, you, all that kind of stuff. And they entered the water. They submitted to God's judgment, which is in baptism. And they came out knowing that they were, their past was cleansed. They felt God's signature on John's proclamation. Their sin was forgiven. They emerged ready to change their life in preparation for this unbelievable 
fulfillment of, the, of, the, of what the prophets have been saying for thousands of years. Jesus, now this is what's so curious. He's the son of God. He's lived in Nazareth for most of his 30 years. He left his carpenter shop and he took a, a, a trip that he walked it would have been two to three days at least. Probably did it with other people as well. From Nazareth all the way to wherever it was John was, was in the uh, baptizing in the Jordan River. And he was going with the people and there wasn't anybody who knew he was any different than they were. He was just one of them. And he gets to the river, and everybody thought the same thing. He's just one of us. And they were coming into the Jordan River to be baptized by John. They were confessing their sins. Well, except John. He protested because he knew. Jesus wasn't coming to confess his sin. What was he coming for? As it said in the prophets, that he was numbered among the transgressors. He submitted to baptism just like they did. What was he doing? It almost, you can imagine a guy who owns a business, who then goes around to the human relations department and applies for a job in his own business. To John the Baptist, that's what it looked like. But as Paul said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We think about it in church terms, and those of us, you know, who grow up in the church, we talk about being baptized into Christ, and that that's it, that, that is a concept that is just kind of blows your mind. But first, Jesus had to be baptized into us, which is what he did. He became, as Paul said, sin for us. Not that he was sinning, but he came and took on that guilty burden of humanity that would one day lead to his death. In his death, as a son of God, he laid a just basis for his father to forgive us and welcome us into his family. Which means that he is with us when we, as we struggle with the sins that we don't admit to anybody, as we struggle with the doubts that we don't admit to anybody, as we struggle with the failures in life we don't like to admit, as we struggle with the times when we're just plain faithless. God is with us in our struggle. How far will God go? When is enough enough? With Jesus' disciples, as he lived with them, there are times when he was utterly frustrated with them. There were times he was angry with them. There were times when he was utterly disappointed. There were times when he was grieving. There was the time that he was abandoned, even denied. And yet, as Paul said, Eighth chapter of Romans. He said he, <clears throat> talking about God the Father, who he who gave up his own son for us. Nothing will ever separate us from our <clears throat> from God's love. Nothing. 
The only thing we ever have to fear is that we would reject him. Baptism was Jesus' ordination, his anointing. His father at that occasion gave him authority to rescue us from our hopeless, impossible situation and authority to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. He is with us. We can find refuge in him in all of our life struggle. With God, there is never enough is enough. Nothing will separate us from his love. The Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you know, the, it, it seems to me an advantage. I mean, I, we have to feel like it. If only. Jesus' disciples, they were with him. They could see him. They could hear him. They could touch him. They, I mean, they were with him. And when they had their problems, they could talk to him just physically. And, and, and if you're like me, and I know that you must be, you know, there are things in life you just want to have some way of seeing something substantial that we can, you know, in, in dealing with God. And yet, what did Jesus tell his disciples when he was about to leave them in that substantial way? He said, it's better for you that I leave you. I can send you my, the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the wind, Jesus said. Can't see it, but you see its results. Jesus' disciples, they in the in, in they say writing in the New Testament, they write how they learned to discover the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. They learned to uh, to experience His presence in their praying, in their worship in their ministry, in their spiritual walk. I want you to think about a spiritual walk. As we walk with God, with the Spirit through life, the path that we walk is paved with repentance. What is the Spirit doing? He is enlightening our walk, which we recognize the darkness that we're living in. And we can embrace the light in just all the details of life. To walk in the light. It's a path of repentance. Psalm 119 is an absolutely wonderful psalm to get kind of a feel about what this life is like. As Paul would say, it's a life of putting off the darkness and putting on that glorious light as children of God who have been forgiven. What does God, what does the Spirit use to do this? You know, all the way through the Bible, but you see this in the New Testament. God takes what is spiritual and inhabits what is human. And those are the means that he uses to communicate with us. Don't make the mistake of saying, well, the word of God is spiritual. Well, it is. Because God inhabits human words. Now, they become his words. But words are human. They're the way human beings communicate. God then takes those words and inhabits them and turns them in. Well, you get the idea. It's not only the words. It's water in baptism. It's the bread and the wine in Holy Communion. He inhabits, the Spirit inhabits them. And this is the way what he does to communicate to us. 
And as we learn to, to, to walk in his word and in his sacrament, as we learn to walk in it, he communicates his love and his joy and his peace and patience and kindness and hope in all of those things that the Spirit gives us in our own spirits. As Paul said, the Spirit talks, tells our spirit we're the children of God. He is with us. The certainty is not in things we see going on around us. The certainty is in his promise. And our theology and our experience begin to hold hands. Father, Jesus said, I am with you always. Where are you, God? When it hurts, you are in the middle of our hurts because you are resident in our hearts. And we can only thank you. Amen. Let's sing a wonderful song of the Spirit. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. We'll stand as we sing.
communion, the Holy Spirit is calling us to remember. To remember is to recall what happened in the past. In this case, 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross to lay that basis for our forgiveness and reconciliation with his Father. To recall what happened in the past and bring it into our present. where it can meet us, where our theology and our experience are joined. I, I've got a, well, it's the best benediction I, 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 could, um, I could even imagine from, you know, from the word of God. Let's stand and receive this. This is a word, again, using human words but it's the word of God to you. I will never leave you or forsake. Never. Amen. Sing our doxology. <laughs> Oh, come, Lord.